So today we do have the privilege of hearing from a principal and director of one of the premier design firms in the country, Sasaki and Associates. Joshua Brooks is a professional landscape architect and a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. He received a master's degree in city planning from MIT and holds a bachelor's degree in landscape architecture from Louisiana State. And he's also taught at Northeastern University's School of Architecture on sustainable urban environments. And as I already said, he now serves as the director and principal of Sasaki and Associates in Denver, um, which is about three years old, is that right? Yeah. Uh, Josh sees the built environment as human habitat, which can impact our health, well-being, and social cohesion. He grew up in Louisiana and saw firsthand his state's staggering intervention into the natural systems that support its people. He also learned how tenuous of a relationship the community and its surrounding environment can be when those interventions are mismanaged and poorly devised. Because of his experience, Josh appreciated from an early age that intelligent and thoughtful intervention in the landscape can impact generations of people for the better. Furthermore, these impacts can extend beyond traditional environmental goals of landscape design and planning into social justice, equity, and even anti-racist planning. He's led work on many notable projects, including the University Lakes in Baton Rouge, where dredge is used as a design and construction resource instead of a waste product. And if you attended last week, we heard a lot. We heard from a dredge expert, so today we will see a great example of the implementation of dredge as a resource. Um, he also worked on the award-winning Greenwood Community Master Plan and Implementation, where Sasaki engaged community members to connect isolated assets, uncover and embrace the, ec uh, the ecology of the site, and provide a balance of neighborhood amenities and destination activities. He created a new comprehensive master plan for CU Boulder, a revision and improvement of Sasaki's original master plan from 60 years before, which is a rare opportunity and shows the staying power that that firm has. Um, his office is currently working on the uh, Alinicon Metropolitan Park, did I pronounce that right? The Alinicon Metropolitan Park in Athens, Greece, which is poised to become one of the most significant public spaces in the historic city. This ambitious, ambitious project is underway in collaboration with 10 other offices in the ECAD professions to transform obsolete infrastructure into a restorative and resilient landscape that will become Europe's largest coastal park. These four projects, which exist among so many others, have garnered eight honor and merit awards between them. We're so grateful he's here to speak. Please welcome Josh Brooks. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's always interesting where you get like biographies. Like, I, where did you get that? I, you made that up. <laughs> none of none of that's true. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, I really appreciate the warm welcome and the music was like freaking awesome. I actually walked in here earlier and I was like, I am definitely in the wrong room because uh, it was just like a jam. Um, but no, I, I you know I titled this lecture "Leading with Landscape" and. Um, I think the reason I did that is because I would encourage every single one of you in this room to uh, have the courage and ambition to think that the education you're getting today means that you are a player on the global stage and, and having an outsized impact on people. Um, as my made up bio uh, said, you, like stole the things that I was going to say in this first slide. But, uh, you know, I really do believe that what we do as practitioners is create human habitat. And I, I, I fundamentally believe that cities are part of the natural environment. Every yellow dot, you know, on this image represents a place where people live. And, and anim you know, hum humans, after all, are just animals. We are just people that are here and cities are our habitat, it's just like a bird's nest. Like people, people create places. And, and I think this conflict between, you know, build to natural environment is, is somewhat a manufactured one. Now, the problem with that is for far too long in modern history of, of city development, the wrong people have been in charge. And, um, you know, this dude was literally just putting a building there without thinking about what he was doing in terms of, of the habitat that he was created. And, 
The problem with so much of, of landscape architecture's history, not so much in the, the, the sort of early stages of you know, modern American landscape architecture, but as the, the sort of 20th century unfolded is we kind of like took a back seat. And, and unfortunately, we relegated ourselves to architects and engineers and policymakers and, and said, you know, the city is not necessarily our purview. And so for far too long, so many mistakes were made and, and people thought about cities as collections of objects, collections of infrastructure. But at the end of the day, that's not where we live. We live here. We live in the habitat that we create. And, and ultimately, the human experience, the daily life, the first 40 feet, uh, that sort of nuanced and, and serendipitous moment where people are making eye contact with each other, that's where people live, and I, and I fundamentally believe that landscape architecture is the profession that should be driving every single decision when it comes to the formations and creations of the city as a, as a sort of fundamental level of, of investment. And I think this is, is becoming more important uh, as cities continue to develop and, and developing world uh, you know, urbanizes and, and pretty soon most an overwhelming majority of people will live in cities. And so what this means for us as a profession today uh, is that we have to start shifting our perspective. And I actually stole this uh, series of slides from Anna. Um, but I think what this means is, is really zooming out and seeing us not as people that are doing uh, um, you know, nuanced things, but people that are enacting great change. And so from the same profession, from the same perspective, we need to broaden our horizon and ultimately think more critically. Um, this is what we do at Sasaki. Um, and you know, we are a firm that kicks and screams our way to the, to the table every time to have that outsized impact on the transformation of places. Um, and whether that means thinking about comprehensive uh, city planning systems and understanding that you know landscape architecture and landscape is a driver of climate adaptation, or it is the creation of new public realm and infrastructural transformation in legacy cities. We fundamentally believe that we're we're the people that need to be uh, making those choices, and I think this is incredibly important because I think time and time again. We realize, and, and the pandemic was a, honestly a, a wonderful opportunity for this to kind of resurge, is that nature and, and, and the connection to the outdoor environment only make us a better human species. Um, this guy is the guy that founded our firm, and Hideo Sasaki was a, a landscape architect by training, but he, he came to the table and said, I want to lead with landscape, and I want to create a practice that has an outsized impact on the world. And so he created a collaboration and a collection of, of individuals across architecture, planning, urban design, engineering, to ultimately found and, and form one of the more prominent practices of, of the time. And we were involved in you know, the transformation of corporate headquarters and the expansion of the modernist movement. Uh, but that has evolved into a practice that deals with everything from climate adaptation and resiliency planning um, in cities to the construction of buildings across the, the, the world and uh, you know, campus environments to regional planning uh, you know, on a scale that looks at the entire Louisiana coastline to strategic planning opportunities for real estate and campus and institutions to the design of stadiums. But the, the interesting thing and the reason I chose this, this image is that even when we look at projects like this, a, a new soccer stadium in, in Shanghai, we actually look at it from the perspective of landscape and how landscape can be a driver even in the most architectural of projects. And so this project, the Chicago Riverwalk, is a remarkable example of, of what could have easily become one of those prototypical engineering solutions where, you know, Wacker Drive was kind of falling apart, this, this, this 150 year old infrastructure needed to be advanced. But Sasaki, landscape architects were the prime consultant transforming what was a derelict piece of infrastructure into one of the most celebrated public realms that city has ever had. Um, and this transformation deals with everything from flooding to, uh, you know, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, sort of jurisdiction of navigable channels and all of the complexities. But at the end of the day, it all comes back to this, people. 
How can we create moments of serendipity? How can we create human habitat? And I think the, the challenge and, and the, the push that I would, would give to you all is to not relegate yourselves to other professions, not to say that I'm not the expert, but to, to grab uh, you know, that opportunity to create these types of interventions because you are the profession that is uh, most qualified. And I think this image sums it up perfectly in that others create problems. You know, this is a gigantic petroleum refinery plant that has made this community one of the sickest in Los Angeles. But what we do is we create solutions. Uh, this is a park that has numerous technologies that have been deployed to try and reduce uh, air, you know, air quality issues and ultimately create a, a public realm for a community that has not had one in, in decades. And so, you know, I have a very romantic and, and sort of very positive attitude on what we can do as a, as a profession, and I would encourage everybody to do the same. And that doesn't mean that we don't have to ally ourselves with others. Um, you know, at Sasaki, we have a, a multidisciplinary practice that, that celebrates architecture and planning and urban design, engineering. Um, and we, we all have this sort of mutual respect for one another, but landscape architecture is at the table with those at, at the highest levels of, of decision making. And what that has allowed us to do is really practice all over the world. We've worked on every single continent, uh, you know, numerous times, uh, many, many, many countries. Uh, and our current offices in Denver, Boston, New York, and Shanghai continue to collaborate across the world on some pretty remarkable opportunities. And I'll end the little intro on this quote from Hideo that contribution is the only value. And I, I think I fundamentally believe in this, and I know that our firm still fundamentally believes in this. And to me, what this means is exactly what I said earlier, is like not relegating yourself to other professions, not taking a back seat, but really contributing to positive change in this world. And, and if you care about environmental problems, if you care about social inequities, if you care about infrastructure considerations, the only way to change that is to contribute at the highest level. You can complain all you want, but unless you take a, a, a driving seat approach, uh, nothing, you know, you're never going to be part of the change. And so I would only encourage that. Um, today, I want to talk about four projects, I think, that really represent this notion of leading with landscape. Projects that could have easily been led by another profession, but that landscape architecture took a critical and, and, and leading role in. Uh, transformations on a scale that really are, are hard to kind of almost fathom and, and I think celebrate what the power of landscape architecture can really be. This first project, which Sam mentioned, is the Alinicon Metropolitan Park and Coastal Front, which is in Athens, Greece. And the main premise of this project was what do you do with a piece of derelict infrastructure that is no longer used and how can you transform it into a positive attribute for the city and do it in a way that is the most responsible from an environmental and social uh, perspective. Now, our team started by taking a step back uh, several thousand years because Greece is a very old place and understanding, you know, this is a hundred year old piece of infrastructure that sort of changed, but in the larger context of Athens, there's a lot of evolution that goes into thinking about what a cultural, uh, um, cultural facility and cultural place looks like. And what we figured out and what we, we started to struggle with very early on is that large parks are actually not part of the, the Greek kind of culture. Um, when you look at Athens, it's made up of a number of small places, and this park is literally larger than any other park that is in Athens uh, by far, and honestly, Greek people don't know how to use parks. Um, they don't have Central Park. They don't have Hyde Park. And one of the other interesting things is that this is literally a, a park that's larger than Central Park uh, in New York, larger than Hyde Park, and so the, the sort of effort and, and, and criticality of thinking about such a large piece of land um, became a very, very uh, uh, keen challenge. Um, this is a sort of vision for a new center of gravity in Athens, which has a, 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 a very long-term perspective associated with the design and one that tries to blend together 
uh, this salvaging of infrastructure, this notion of restoration on a scale, uh, you know, hard to imagine, and the idea of really shifting a paradigm of, of public space in a city that has historically not necessarily had that. And so the question is, where do you start with such a crazy project? And for us, it started with uh, this notion of environment and how do we think about this on a larger scale, even, even larger than the site. And so we zoomed out and said, okay, this is actually on the, the Eastern Mediterranean flyway and how do we think about this as a stepping stone to the larger, uh, uh, the larger ecosystem and support larger environmental challenges? Um, we looked at what it meant to take a piece of land that had started to evolve, that had started to have its own ecology, um, and think about restoration as a critical driver in really imagining an entire new landscape that, that would need to last for centuries. And what that ultimately led to was a very systems-based approach where we thought about a complex series of ecologies um, that could be managed over time and could ultimately evolve over time. But one of the interesting things about this project, um, among many others, is that because of the size and complexity of this, this actually outpaced the entire nursery industry of Greece and some of the surrounding countries. And so our team actually had to work on business plans with local nurseries around the, the region to establish new paradigms for grow, actually starting to grow the plants that would ultimately be used in this. And so not only were we designing, but we were actually thinking strategically with an entire industry as to how they could actually supply this project. We're talking about nearly three million plants that would ultimately be needed to support uh, uh, the restoration and creation of this project, including 31,000 new trees, which is on a scale, you know, again, hard to fathom. The other piece of this is, is in thinking about such a complex and, and large scale landscape is, is how do you ensure that you're not creating a place that is actually a suck on resources, uh, particularly water in this area. Athens is a very dry climate. And so our team had to look at uh, uh, early stage water modeling to understand the critical demand that would be created from a park of this size. And then we said, okay, what is the goal here? The goal is to actually move from what is the current baseline, which is you know, irrigated landscapes, just like everywhere in the world, to a place that is truly uh, a net zero water waste uh, place. And, and what that meant is looking at an incredibly diversified water management regime, which included everything from developing uh, an on-site lake uh, that could be uh, uh, managed and, and utilized for uh, water to tapping into a sewage treatment facility to actually capitalized on water reuse, to looking at an incredibly diverse series of uh, water um, stormwater management techniques that would actually slow down and, divert and, and disperse water across the landscape. Um, and so what, what became, um, you know, a really challenge, you know, really big challenge to deliver, uh, you know, a huge kind of landscape ultimately led to innovation in water resource management and it has actually shifted a little bit of the way that the, the local landscape uh, community thinks about water management in, in Greece. Ultimately, the results of this are a truly, you know, transformational project. Um, and I, I think this image is, is a powerful one because it shows some of the complexities of this project that, again, landscape architecture took a driving force on. You know, the creation of new pedestrian and, and, and vehicular bridges, weaving of infrastructure, dealing with new, tra you know, train alignments, road alignments, understanding sort of development patterns and the, the, the implementation and synergy of those into a larger landscape. Uh, the creation of a new beach that had some fairly challenging erosion issues that we established a new kind of dune landscape on the backside uh, to, to help with some of those. And I think to, to go back to this notion of, of actually working with industry, one of the other critical challenges here was that because of the scale of this project, uh, we started to think very early on about the, the outsized carbon impact that this would have. And so we pressured ourselves to think critically about the material use on the project. And so we actually did an analysis 
of the, the various material industries that exist within Greece to try and understand what, not just the vernacular materiality, but actually the most sustainable materials that can be utilized. And so you know, when you think of Greece, you don't necessarily think of aluminum, but Greece is one of the larger producers of aluminum in Europe. And so we started to think, okay, instead of steel, we're gonna use aluminum on a lot of our uh, shade structures, handrails, things like that. Uh, and ultimately we used this to create a model uh, uh, for the park that reduced our carbon emissions tremendously. The other thing uh, that, that I think is probably one of the cooler stories of this project is you have a, a, you know, 1,200 acres of airport. That is a lot of existing concrete and asphalt and other materials. And to sort of scrape away that would be a tremendous amount of waste. And so our team thought very, very critically about how we could actually reuse materials on site. Um, and so this is some of the existing images. You can see there's huge kind of concrete slabs that make up the runways. And one of the cool things in Athens is they actually use marble as the aggregate. And so, um, you know, it's actually this beautiful material. And so our team came up with this idea to actually start and harvest uh, of, of some of these resources. And so uh, we came up with a number of ideas of, of creating actually a, a plant on site that would pound some of the existing asphalt and some of the, the more uh, derelict and, and, and less interesting pieces into aggregate that would serve as a, an aggregate base for all of the new pavement. Uh, and then we actually started to farm uh, this whole blue section. So we, we actually cut giant pieces of the tarmac up and created furniture and, and uh, other or elements of it, ultimately reusing roughly 28,000 uh, square meters of concrete, which is in, insane. I mean, that's a ton of concrete. Um, and not just using it in aggregate, not just using it in benches, but, but trying to actually celebrate the material quality of this through the creation of monumental kind of landscape moves. And so this entire water feature in the Olympic Square is actually by taking these huge concrete slabs, cutting them up and then tilting them on their face to expose the kind of marble aggregate and creating this epic uh, kind of water feature. And so this, this kind of creativity and this rigor around a huge challenge of how to create a place and not just be a, con a huge kind of material exporter and, and, and waste producer uh, led to a lot of innovations and a lot of creativity in that. Uh, ultimately creating places for people to gather just like every kind of parks and open space, but doing it in a way that had an outsized impact on the community. Uh, ultimately, this project uh, will, will achieve carbon neutrality in 35 years. Uh, and our team used this as a case study to actually test some of our internal research uh, with a tool that we've developed called Carbon Conscious. Uh, which actually quantifies every single decision around materiality that we've made. And so we're able to say, you know, these decisions that we've ultimately made uh, in the design create a project that truly does have a, a huge impact on carbon emissions uh, in, in Europe. And, and at the end of the day, I think what was really exciting for us and, and the, the history of Athens um, really kind of put us in this, this kind of romantic idea of really creating a park for a thousand years. Athens is so much older than anything in the United States. And so working on a project like this puts you in a time scale that is unlike anything you, you do in the States. And so every decision we made, every design move we made, ultimately had that notion that this place and what we were doing was actually setting up uh, a series of, of kind of experiments that would last for not decades, but, but truly centuries. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say that this kind of project takes a huge team. This was not just me, this was not just Anna, this was not just one or two people. This is a team of like 25 people at Sasaki working uh, honestly through the pandemic on this project. And I, I love this, this rendering or this gift that sort of shows all of us in Miro working in our bedrooms on what would be the, you know, Europe's largest park. And so it's a really, really amazing opportunity um, to deliver that. Uh, the next project is uh, University Lakes, which takes us all the way back to the U.S. and honestly back to the, my hometown of uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And University Lakes is a, a fascinating, fascinating uh, project. Um, and it started actually in 1927 uh, with the Civilian Conservation Corps. 
Uh, I, think, I think they said a thousand men dug this lake, um, which is like a weird metric to have. Um, but ultimately what they did was they dug a big hole in what used to be a, a giant, beautiful cypress swamp uh, with the idea of creating space for suburban development uh, to extend from downtown Baton Rouge out to the, uh, out to the swamplands. Um, and this, I love this image, this is like such a romantic notion of what the 1940s and 50s should look like with, uh, you know, people, ex you, know, enjoying, uh, you know, enjoying the water and the slab on grade house, you know, growing in the background. Um, and, you know, what's interesting about this is in the past hundred years, the use of the lake has not changed. This is exactly what people still do today. But the problem is, is that it is literally on the brink of environmental collapse. Um, so <laughs> it is funny. Um, so this is what the university lake system looks like today. And all of that green stuff is, is algae and duckweed that's growing uh, in the lake and causing hyper, hyper eutrophication, ultimately creating fish kills that happen basically once a year. Um, and what has happened, uh, I don't know if you realize this, but when you dredge a swamp, uh, it just wants to become a swamp again. And so over the course of 100 years, the lake has been filling in, filling in uh, through sedimentation that's coming from a large urban watershed. But also as these algae blooms happen, um, all of this stuff dies, it sinks to the bottom and, and ultimately creates more algae. And so this is a, a, a really challenging piece of, of, of ecology that's literally killing itself on a daily basis. And um, you know, left up to its own fruition, this would literally turn into a swamp probably in five or 10 years. Um, but the problem is, is all of these people that live around it don't want it to be a swamp. And it creates huge environmental challenges. The water quality is absolutely terrible. The fish population is, is struggles to survive. And all of the, the nutrient-rich water that, that doesn't actually get filtered through this lake system literally just deposits into the bayou downstream and continues down uh, into the watershed. So our team was hired to develop a comprehensive strategy that would uh, save the lakes from itself uh, and ultimately create a new recreational system uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the process. So our team looked at uh, a comprehensive water story um, that started by understanding that while we could not turn this back into a swamp system, we could start to look at the novel ecosystems that used to be there uh, and understand the benefits that those systems might have deployed. And so our team sort of took those deep cross sections and thought about the various types of ecologies that would have been there and the types of environmental performances and use that to build a model, a logic model that we could look to, we could use to deploy strategies across what is about 11 linear miles and about 275 acres of water. Um, and by doing this, we, we essentially c uh, created a series of typological conditions across the, the lake's edges to try and understand um, not only the, the, what would have been there, but the existing conditions that are there today. Uh, ultimately, to try and understand the existing issues that are uh, existing along the site. We then zoomed back out to try and understand the, the hydrologic story and the problems that exist there. Um, what looks like one big lake is actually a series of little uh, lakes that actually all have varying water elevations, have different inflows and outflow points, um, and have a series of degrading infrastructures that dump uh, urban watershed directly into the water. And so our team started to try and understand that, that condition to, to see if we could uh, resolve those. And, and again, we took a systems-based approach uh, by looking at all of those existing typologies that I showed earlier, uh, seeing how they related to some of the existing challenges like uh, storm outflows coming in, and then ran those through that, that sort of logic model that I, I showed earlier to essentially develop a systems-based approach and, a, and, and a, a solution to each one of those challenges. And this just represents one of those areas. So that was kind of the, the water story. And then, you know, you, re you saw that, that, that complex circle. The reality was is that people wanted to fix the water story, but they, they didn't want to address the real issues at hand, and they didn't want to necessarily look at the complex situation that the rest of the lake sat in. And so our team kind of had to run around the circle and really make sure we understood every single issue. 
So this next piece of the project was really trying to understand why there was a discrepancy in access to this lake system. Um, and so we, we looked at the, both the quality and the, the sort of location of, of all of the trail system and all of the street network across, around the lake system and, and noticed some major kind of gaps in access. While this is just a stone's throw away from the lake, it has limited access. And we said, why is that the case? And so we took a step back and actually thought about the historical uh, conditions that existed and realized that there was a huge redlining uh, effort in, in the 50s uh, for Old South Baton Rouge, which meant that you can actually see here this giant break in the street network and all of the infrastructure meant that the people of Old South Baton Rouge could not access uh, this lake system. And so another thing we wanted to solve here. The, the last kind of major sort of political challenge that this, this project contends with is that everybody loves the view of this lake. And so when we started to talk about dredge, and the use of dredge and the placement of dredge along this lake system, everybody thought we were lake basically going to fill in the lake and nobody was going to be able to see water anymore. And so we had to come up with a way to tell the story that actually you're wrong. You would be able to see uh, uh, water. And so our team actually built a 3D model and developed a program that quantifies points along every single facade along the lake's edge. And, and calculated their sort of view spectrum that they see of the existing water. And then we use this tool to basically test various scenarios to say, actually, you were here and you're still here, even though we put a bunch of, of dredge in front of your yard. And so this became a tool to come overcome very, very serious political barriers. So all of that was basically this, this inventory and analysis effort to get us to the point where we were able to actually engage with the community. And so we came up with a, a strategy to have a conversation about some very serious and complex challenges, uh, ultimately to create a series of guidelines. And, and what this took was us really learning how to tell a story about all of these systems. And so we had to create collateral to really sort of think through uh, uh, how somebody would digest this material. We had to think about how we engage the local community to actually participate in the work. And so we, we created what we called our Lakes Fest and uh, invited a series of local artists to actually come and be part of the, 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 the workshop. And then uh, Anna and I sat in 97 degree weather with mask on and talked to 700 people in one day. Um, that was not fun. Um, and, and part of the, the, the biggest challenge was making sure people understand what dredge meant. Um, there was actually a previous master plan done by one of our competitors in 2016 uh, that presented a vision for this site that was completely wrong and completely infeasible. And when we, were, we, were, we came to the project, um, what we quickly realized is everybody thought there was all of this opportunity to do things that was just impossible. It would have taken what, what is currently a, a roughly $200 million project and made it $400, $500 million. Um, it was, it was a, a, my opinion, an irresponsible uh, use, of, uh, use of our services. But one of the critical things we had to do was really help people understand. So we had this printed out huge, about a little, a little smaller than this. But, uh, and we walked people through so they understood every decision that we were telling them you know, we can't put trails here, we can't put a park here, we have to do wetlands, we have to do this. We sort of talk them through on this, on this spectrum of, of upland to lowland um, to, help them, to help them really understand. And then we ran them through those scenarios. We said, these are the existing conditions and, and we work with them to give a number of, of scenarios about different edge conditions that could exist in each of those typologies, um, really to gather input about the things that mattered to them help them to understand that when we talk about ecological restoration on this scale, we're not talking about creating a, a sort of quote unquote swamp that nobody wanted, but something that could be beautiful at the same time. We worked uh, really sort of hand in hand with the community to test out a number of different programmatic scenarios. Uh, there was a huge concern from a lot of the residents around here that people were gonna be quote unquote playing basketball in their front yard, which was like a ridiculous notion to begin with, but uh, nonetheless, we had to help them understand that, yes, there are different ways that we could deal with this. And so we created a number of those programmatic scenarios. And so from that systems level thinking, 
um, you know, the biggest kind of challenges of water quality management and, and uh, sort of racial discrepancies and access to this, this area. Uh, we sort of zoomed in and said, okay, how do we deploy this and operationalize this uh, on a scale that can be understood? And so we, we zoomed into what we called the focus area and played out all of these kind of considerations. Um, we looked at the engagement results on a sort of nuanced basis, and then we sort of deployed that, that kind of systems-based approach uh, to this smaller area uh, because 11 linear miles is really hard to kind of comprehend at once, and so we wanted to sort of work through some of those mechanics. Um, so we looked at the ecological kind of framework that we would set up. How do we create different types of wetlands? How do we create different types of, of, of upland areas? We looked at the various hydrologic and water quality considerations, where uh, outflows were and how we needed to, to address each one of those. We looked at the kind of programmatic makeup and we looked, oh, sorry. We looked at the circulation patterns to understand where those conflicts were and how we could deploy a better system. Ultimately, working through that kind of deep cross-section on a more technical level, deploying uh, a series of strategies around dredge placement. So everywhere you see yellow would be dredge placement uh, and doing it in that nuanced way that could actually work and actually be deployed. Uh, and then really kind of understanding when we look at those landscape typologies uh, and those landscape systems, what does that mean for people and how do they start to use those? Uh, ultimately creating a vision for recreation and ecological restoration along that, that sort of stretch that cr created a series of nodes for people to uh, inhabit as well. And then from that focus area, we then zoomed back out to say, how do we actually deploy this across 11 linear miles? And so this represents you know, basically the full kind of concept design uh, that we developed. And one of the critical things was, again, understanding how we actually operationalize and how we actually use dredge material to create new land. And so one of the first things we had to do was actually look at where we had program based on those conversations and where we actually needed to think about real, um, you know, real sort of structural rigidity and where we could think about more softer placements of, of dredge material. Um, you know, we ran through a kind of matrix exercise where, where we looked at the kind of relative cost, the relative sort of compaction rate of dredge, how long it would take uh, to understand, again, where, where these elements could potentially happen, ultimately creating, again, a comprehensive vision for this system that deployed a real sort of system-based approach, but one that created uh, uh, places for people uh, as well. Uh, ultimately, what this led to was a vision uh, and, and uh, a kind of overall approach for what would be about 170 to $200 million of uh, work that would need to, to go on. And so in addition to that kind of design work, one of the critical things and the critical strategies that we had to, to think about was how do you actually build something like this? Um, and so we actually worked with the, the client team, which is a very diverse group of state, local, uh, and, and institutional uh, stakeholders to think about uh, how to break this project up into a series of smaller uh, bite-sized kind of things that could actually be implemented. Uh, we created what we call the prioritizer tool, which is a capital planning tool that we've, we've developed in-house. And we created a series of kind of cost-benefit models uh, through the lens of, of social, economic, and environmental impact and looked at, uh, you know, across them, you know, cost benefit, economic benefit, phasing benefit, available funds, you know, community benefit, political impact. And so we were trying to think of every single way that we could kind of evaluate how we actually make decisions about what is in first phase. And what we did is we developed a, a, a platform where we were able in real time to say, okay, this is less important and this is more important. And what that did was actually rank, start to rank a series of projects that could be chosen to basically build up into a phasing plan. And so in addition to design, really thinking strategically uh, about how something like this gets implemented. We also work with the client to understand what it meant uh, to actually build a landscape over time. Uh, ultimately developing uh, what we called the, the interim landscape, which would actually be used to, to essentially uh, dewater some of the dredge uh, material. And ultimately, uh, this project, which is actually about to break ground uh, here in the next couple of months, uh, is going to deliver uh, an amazing kind of public realm that, that helps to establish 
uh, proper, uh, uh, proper hydrologic functions within the lake system uh, to establish uh, a new paradigm for ecological restoration uh, in the south and ultimately create a public realm that uh, you know, can, can truly be beloved by the community. Uh, so this next project is one uh, kind of near and dear to my heart and, and one that kind of freaks me out every time I look at this image. Um, but this is the Inglewood oil field redevelopment in Los Angeles, California. And this is actually the largest urban oil field in the entire country. It's about 800 acres of active uh, oil operations. And our team was hired to help the client conceptualize how to repurpose this from oil into a new community. Uh, utilizing a strategy that looked at everything from environmental justice to uh, uh, considerations around urban growth and, and how to establish a new landscape system. And so we, we looked at this through the lens of history and environmental justice. We looked at it through a sustainable community development lens. We looked at it through open space and connectivity and looked at how it could integrate into the existing urban fabric. Um, now, this site is absolutely insane uh, because there's like hundreds of feet of grade change across it. There's all of these existing kind of access roads to every individual oil field. And so our team had to think very, very strategically about how we started to deliver a framework plan that actually worked with uh, some of the oil infrastructure. Um, while we would love to say that we could just decouple it right now and it wouldn't be an oil field and, and we would just do whatever we wanted. The reality was is that this actually needed to stay in operation as it redeveloped over time. And so our team actually worked with the client to build a custom software program that looked at the, uh, the actual relative productivity of each well uh, and delivered essentially zones that we felt could be uh, uh, utilized uh, as early phases and later phases. And so this platform ultimately became part of the strategic sort of redevelopment uh, uh, planning. Now, this site sits literally in the middle of LA County uh, next to NPR's headquarters in Culver City and um, you know, sits in an area uh, that has had a very interesting past and an evolution from where it is today and, and where it was 50 years ago. Um, there was a, a, a huge push, uh, again, redlining is always a, a common theme in urban environments, um, but uh, this, this site actually sat in the, the, the center of what was called the Black Beverly Hills, um, and it was a place where upper middle class uh, black individuals uh, you know, came from the, the Hollywood area and actually uh, settled in this, uh, creating a very, very uh, intact neighborhood that, that had very high ownership rates and, and was uh, a place where people took a lot of pride in their, their neighborhood. Um, and it sits, I mean, literally in, with the 405 and the, the I-10 right in the heart of, of LA and, and has a tremendous amount of access to a huge uh, a variety of neighborhoods. And so thinking about what this piece of property meant um, you know, to, to the larger community was a very interesting task. But the reality is, is nobody really knew that it existed. There was all of these very diverse edge conditions that had huge topographic changes that really stopped people's views into the property. And so everybody kind of just thinks this is a piece of open space when it actually is a huge uh, uh, oil operation, which is a fascinating kind of uh, cultural thing to work within. Um, so our team looked at uh, some of the existing facilities and context, open space, rec centers, all of those kind of things. We looked at the urban fabric and how it just sort of came to this place and decayed um, and how that sort of influences the way we think about urban patterns. Uh, we looked at the kind of cultural conditions and the, the sort of urban form of each of those areas. Um, and we sort of zoomed out and said, what are the kind of transportation corridors that are connecting to and through this area? La Cienica Boulevard is a, a huge sort of stretch that connects to West Hollywood all the way down um, close, to, uh, close to LAX. And what's fascinating is, is as it comes through here, it turns into basically a highway, but just north and just south, it's actually this kind of wonderful kind of cultural uh, 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 main street. And so, you know, our team had to, had to contend with that. We also had to understand the sort of policy context that this project was working within. Um, LA has some pretty strict guidance around hillside ordinances. We had a, an existing kind of novel ecosystem which had popped up within the oil field that we had to understand. Uh, we had uh, existing kind of infrastructure projects that were happening around the site. 
uh, it sits right within a, what's called a high, high hazard fire zone. And so we had to understand what that meant and, and how the development could actually work within that. Uh, there's a series of faults that are running through. And so every single imaginable issue that a piece of land could have, this project basically had to contend with it. Uh, and ultimately this like horribly ugly map, I, I think gives it, you know, shows it, shows it well, but like there's oil infrastructure literally everywhere. There's huge pipelines, there's these faults running through, um, and, it, and it creates this just naughty, naughty place that, uh, you know, is like a perfect balance test of the petroleum industry in general. It's just like a dirty, dirty, messy place. And so how do we start to think about what a new paradigm for what this land could look like? And so our team developed a couple of design parameters and physical design approaches um, that really focused on how to turn what we called sort of black gold into a green future. How do you take this notion of a, of a horrible piece of land and turn it into something that could, everybody could be proud of? How do we think about all of the kind of uh, 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 form and function of the city that just sort of disintegrated as it came into this site? And how do we think about patching the quilt back together and thinking about an integrated approach? How do we put landscape first as a driver of, of kind of urban redevelopment and urban form and think about new ways that the open space that did sit around it could weave through this site? And how do we think about repurposing what was a, an active contributor to real environmental injustices into something that had public good? And so, you know, giving over the best land to public space, thinking about integration into those existing communities. Ultimately, ultimately, with the goal of creating what we saw as a model for sustainable and resilient urban redevelopment uh, that has a myriad of opportunities for residential uh, development and green space to really create uh, a, a special place that everybody in LA could be proud of. And the ultimate vision for this site is one of, of total transformation. Now this is a 10, 15, 20 year time horizon for this to transform from an oil field into the vision that we see on the screen. But it's important to start to think about how to layer in human considerations into what seems like the most complex kind of land use planning exercise imaginable. And so our team early on started creating a series of these kind of vignettes to just talk about the experience. Like what do we ultimately want this place to be and function? And so it wasn't, you know, we didn't start by saying, okay, this is residential, this is, this is commercial, this is an open space. We started by saying like, what is the moment we wanna create? Do we wanna perch people up on this hillside with a view of the Pacific Ocean? Do we wanna create a park that has these views towards downtown and the, 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 the surrounding Santa, Santa Ana Mountains? Do we wanna create a place where sort of infrastructure and people collide? There's all of these existing kind of um, uh, uh, electrical corridors that run on the site. And we thought, wouldn't that be cool if those were also productive landscapes? And so these kind of, uh, of, kind of you know, vignettes were, were used very early on in the process to establish what we wanted that human habitat to become. And then we took a step back and we said, okay, if that's the experience we wanna create, how do we put, a, it put in place the policy systems and the physical framework systems that ultimately become part of the kind of regulatory framework that a project like this unfolds through? And so we started by thinking about these various scales of district typologies, um, you know, thinking about the kind of neighborhood corner, thinking about the sort of neighborhood center, thinking about the kind of regional place, and then ultimately thinking about this as a, a larger node within LA. Um, ultimately with this idea of, of, of really establishing a pattern that, that could be replicated across the site. And then deploying that at the sort of neighborhood scale and thinking about the kind of diverse communities that we wanted to create stepping down in scale to the public realm and, and understanding the kind of toolkit uh, that we would need to deploy across 650 acres, thinking about streets, not just for cars, but for people. And then ultimately, after all of that consideration of public realm and public life, what do buildings look like? And so this notion of leading with landscape in a project of this scale, I think ultimately leads to better plans that can be conceptualized and then that system can be put in place for them to unfold over time and ultimately create a vision for the future that I think is very different from that, that, that dude sort of putting the building down in the city that I showed early on. Okay, the last project is a, a project that we just started working on not too long ago um, called Printers Hill and this is in Colorado Springs. Uh, and this is actually a, a former 
tuberculosis and black lung ward for the Printers Union of America. And uh, over the course of 130 years, 40,000 people actually lived and died on this property. And most of them were like cremated in this building, which is kind of creepy, but um, you know, nonetheless. And, and so, you know, on a project like this, you know, typically client might hire an architect or something to, to sort of tell them exactly what to happen. But our client fortunately uh, hired us to really think about a systems-based approach and a public life-based approach for how we could actually repurpose uh, this facility and, and breathe new life into this campus uh, in a way that really was about human habitat and, and, and public life. Um, these are like just crazy images. This is like a six foot tall cast iron door. Um, so our team again took a step back and looked at that sort of history of the site and, and as a, a way to inspire kind of a vernacular of, of architecture and landscape. They had all these like awesome kind of porch life conditions and they have all these amazing kind of architectural uh, follies in the landscape. But over time, this, this piece of land actually grew uh, uh, very organically. They had all these yurts, they had buildings that had been moved. And, and so by tracking that kind of development over time and, and uncovering some of the history of the site, this actually even had its own kind of dairy farm and productive landscape. We started to build a logic for would become you know, the, the foundation of public life. And, and even before we started drawing, we sort of zoomed out to the, the larger scale and, so, and said, what is the kind of landscape context that a property like this exists in? Uh, the front range of Colorado is a stunning, stunning mountain range similar to what you have here. And, and this sort of site sits, sits nestled there with axial views to Pikes Peak. Now, the ultimate sort of mission that the, the, the group of, of landowners gave us was to preserve this facility. Um, but, but we really pushed them to think holistically about a vision here that, that, ha that, that really played on the kind of mind, body, and soul uh, of Colorado Springs to create a place for wellness, to create a place for community, to create a place for uh, um, all people. And the result is a, a, a really compelling kind of master plan vision for a campus-like setting that embeds new forms of housing, public realm, commercial and hospitality development into a kind of framework for the site uh, that, that, again, breathes new life into here but, but respects the historic uh, heritage of, of the campus. And you know, our team really wanted to preserve some of that sort of landscape vernacular and those amazing kind of historic attributes. And so we, we very early on established a series of critical kind of principles around preservation and how do we, we respect the historic axes? How do we think about the existing sort of tree canopy that, that, that is established in this kind of backwards J pattern? How do we respect the sort of axial relationships of the, the historic campus and ensure that whatever we do fits into that sort of framework? And then we started with the public realm. What is the kind of activi activities? What is the activation? What's the, the sort of experience that we wanted each individual person to have as they engaged with this site? And ultimately led the creation of the master plan around mobility and even parking strategies and, and thinking about how the experience of people getting out of a, of, 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 of a parking garage meant, uh, uh, you know, from a public life standpoint ultimately creating a very schematic, this is an early, early master plan, we're actively engaged in this project, um, but a vision for how public realm and development could actually happen together. Uh, we then wanted to think really critically about those, those connectivity to the larger kind of uh, 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 landscape of, of Colorado Springs and the connections to the view. So we built a view shed model that actually analyzed the existing views that the, the, the castle and the, the land had to the surrounding landscape and then stuck our model in there to ensure that we weren't mucking up some of the things that we cared about. We created visions for the public realm that, that truly harkened back to this as a campus for people, for health and wellness, um, and ultimately created these visions for full integration of a new mixed use and, and, and community center into a historic setting, really respecting some of those existing architectural follies that were the, in, in the landscape, but breathing new contemporary life into the place. Um, really thinking through what this site could be in the winter and the spring and, and really thinking about that sort of procession of landscape into architecture. 
um, really expressing the kind of views and celebrating the views of Pikes Peak through, through really looking back towards what were some of the decisions they made back in the day to create these porches that allowed people to sit and take in the air, and how can we recreate that as a, as a true kind of human experience. And then ultimately, we, we did start working with our architectural colleagues at, at Sasaki, but again, leading with this notion of public realm, leading with this notion of public experience, we created these series of processional experiences through the landscape uh, and, and thinking about people interacting with new development and old facilities, even thinking about the integration of public realm through the, 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 the new buildings and ultimately into an experience of, of kind of a new civic quad right in the heart of the space. And thinking about the integration of architecture and landscape at all scales and how we can really consider a lot of the, the kind of uh, strategies that were deployed in the, the early uh, foundations of this campus around those precious views to the front range uh, and how those could be deployed in the new, uh, new kind of strategies. Uh, ultimately driving the conversation around block formation and building typology by, by really expressing the public realm and, and making the architecture fit to the landscape uh, and creating a place where, where new forms of habitation and new forms of development could exist. Um, and and to, to kind of build off what I was talking about with uh, University Lakes is, is this notion of strategy and how landscape architects can actually work with clients outside of just design work. Um, you know, these people had an existing property that hadn't been maintained in years. And so we actually work with them to understand what they could do now, how they could save money, how they could preserve, rejuvenate, and activate their property today as almost a business planning exercise. And so we developed this interim activation plan uh, which looked at everything from public art to short-term building maintenance to actually plan out the way that they would operate their business uh, uh, over the next couple of years while the site developed. We look for strategies for new art installation and have engaged in uh, with the city's cultural, um, cultural division to actually put out an RFP for artists to engage in the property. Uh, we've looked at branding exercises to, to really uh, uh, create an opportunity for the community to feel like they can engage with this property. We went through an extensive analysis of over 750 trees um, to understand what trees had to come down and when. Uh, and so unfortunately we do have to take down about 500 trees, but that's because they're dying. Uh, but we looked at ways to make that process actually something that, that could be engaged in. We looked at everything from uh, turf management. We, they, they were mowing like 25 acres of turf. And we said, you don't need to do that anymore. Um, and so we created a, a kind of a folly way of thinking about it. Uh, ultimately, to lead them down the road where they could implement this vision, but actually engage in the property uh, right now. And so I want to bring it back to, to this image and just encourage you all to think about the scale of projects that I just talked about and really understand that I fundamentally believe that what we do as landscape architects can change the world and can have an outsized impact and that everything we do is part of a kind of natural process of building human habitat. And we don't want to leave it up to this guy because he doesn't create the types of places that we do. And ultimately, what we do is create human habitat. Thank you. We have time for a couple questions. Anyone want to start us off? Yeah. So you talked a lot about all the analysis and like information gathering that you had to do for all of these projects. And I noticed especially like the ecological stuff and the sociological stuff, uh, how much of that is your like internal team and how much of that is consulting elsewhere? Like 90% internal team, yeah. I mean, we, we go through extensive and rigorous analysis on every single project. Um, and you know where we can't, where our expertise ends, we engage with consultants. But I think one thing that I would strongly encourage, and this kind of goes back to the, one of the points that I was making, is that just because you might not be an expert in something doesn't mean that you can't contribute. And so 
you know, when you hire a consultant, they're going to do the one job that you hired them to do, and they're not going to like bring that to the next level. So I, I fundamentally believe it's the job of the landscape architect to, to take that information and interpret it. Um, and so, you know, even on the 10% of information that might have been generated by a consultant, we're the ones digesting it and deciding what to do with it. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, you mentioned um, the role of like public engagement in a lot of these projects, including situations where either the stakeholders or the public's expectations of what they wanted maybe weren't in line with what you knew was best yeah. or what the site needed. Yeah. Um, as a firm, or in, or in your own opinion, like what are the what's your approach to? Public engagement. What are the moments in the design process when you you decide like we need the public's input on this piece? How do you go about deciding when you need that versus when you actually need to educate or or when you as experts know actually what's best for a particular? Yeah. I, I mean, I would say there's not like a single point in time when that happens, um, and I would say it's it's all it's like all of the above all the time. Um, you know, when we think about public engagement, we think about it as a spectrum from the, the very start of the project where we have yet to draw a single thing, asking questions, engaging people, building conversations around ownership and, and excitement, all the way to celebratory moments. Um, you know, I didn't show this, but uh, the project that Sam mentioned, Greenwood Park, um, we actually work with the client at the very end of the project to throw a party like we came up with this idea of party in the park and told them you know you guys gotta we gotta get a band we gotta get people to make food we gotta get you know we gotta basically make the the master plan a reality for one day so that all the people that were skeptical and engaged in the process could come to this and see the potential and literally a th over a thousand people showed up to this event and we were, we were kind of unsure what the, the mayor and the council person were gonna say, which were at odds. And they stood up on the stage together and said, this is like a dream. And like it literally made everything, the, the kind of like collective blood pressure sort of drop. Um, and so community engagement is a, is a spectrum that you have to engage or be a part of. It's not, it's not, you know, you ask a bunch of questions at the beginning or you create a survey, like it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Um, I guess to the other side of the, the question about like, what, what to do you know, as, as experts in something versus you know, community's desire. Um, it's a great question, and it's, it's one that's, you know, we're always sort of at healthy, healthy tensions. Um, I, I don't think it's the job, your job, to sort of just open-endedly ask people what they want and then say, like, yes. Um, if they're wrong, you need to work through that with them and educate them as to why they're wrong. And it's not about like convincing people of opinions, it's about working through the challenges. So like University Lakes, all of, you know, the, this half of the, 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 the community on one side of the lake was just dead set that we were wrong and that we, you know, there, you didn't need to do anything. You just needed to, to dredge the lake and throw it into the Mississippi River and everything would be fine. Uh, but what we had to do is we, we had to work with them to make them realize that if you did that, 20 years from now, we'd be back in the exact same spot because that's what's literally been happening for every 20 years for the, for the past 100 years. And so we had to educate them on this is actually what watershed management means. This is actually what green infrastructure does. This is what actually is the problem of hyper eutrophication and everything. And then we had to create those, those tools like the view thing that I showed to say your concern about us filling in the whole lake and not being able to see water is actually wrong. And here's, you know, here's a metric to show you that you're, you're wrong. And like, we got yelled at a bunch. Uh, somebody, you know, <laughs> like tried to convert me to a religion I didn't want to be a part of, but like, you know, it like, there's like these really intense moments, but like, that's your job is like, your job is to, to help that community, even if they don't want to be, or not, even if they don't want to be helped, but even if they don't like the initial kind of outcome. Um, because you know, ultimately, you, you, are, you are sort of expert. Now, in saying that, that, there's like this really kind of uh, 
sort of historic perspective of like planning, making terrible decisions about, you know, certain things and ruining, you know, communities and stuff. And so you got to be careful about that, but it's definitely not, you know, community engagement's job to just say like, what do you want? And then, you know, do that. Um, hopefully that answers your question. I think there was a hand in the back of yeah, that guy. We should probably end this now. Oh. Um, and then we can continue questions and conversation upstairs in the comments studio, but let's give it up for Josh one more time.